All right, so this is our first lesson on magnetism. This is chapter eight. So in this lesson, there isn't any math problems. Usually when I teach this, I do a whole bunch of demonstrations. But I don't have any of my magnetism equipment. So we're just going to walk through the PowerPoint and I'll explain it. You can get the PowerPoint on the website. And I'm also going to post some YouTube videos from other people that um, I recommend watching. All right, so natural magnetism and electromagnetism. All right, so we talked about electric fields and we can talk about magnetic fields as well. Now usually, again, you probably, maybe you haven't, but you might have seen or played with a magnet and iron filings and the iron filings sort of take the shape around the magnet showing you that there are fields there. This is actually something that um, kids have been doing for hundreds of years, even before Faraday came up with the idea of fields, right? They just thought it was a fun trick and toy to play with. Um, Faraday was the first person who started actually thinking there was something real that we couldn't see and started making dozens and dozens of diagrams for different situations, just mapping where the iron filings would go. And then he did it so much he can actually see the fields in his mind. And he called them fields. Now, this is another interesting picture because it shows a compass. Now the compass always points south. No, I did not make a mistake when I said that. The compass always points south. Right? So you can see the magnetic field here go away from the north end as the arrows are pointing around, coming back down to the south end. And then inside a magnet, they're pointing from south to north, but on the outside, they're pointing from north to south. Okay. So why did I say that? I know you've learned your entire life, a compass always points north. Well, there are two different norths and two different souths. Let's explain that. Here, I have a picture of the earth right here. And then I have a magnet. Now, there's not a huge magnet in the center of the earth, but we're just going to represent um, earth's liquid iron core spinning around there as just a magnet. And it has a south end and a north end. And then I have this other line here, which has a north and a south. Now, this line is the rotational axis of the earth. And we've labeled this part in the northern hemisphere, the North Pole. Now notice that the magnetic South Pole is very close to the geographic North Pole. This is why when you take a compass, we always say a compass points north. Well, it points fairly close to the geographic North Pole, but it's pointing directly to the magnetic South Pole. So that's a misconception. A lot of people think if you go stand on the North Pole, your compass will start spinning in a circle. No, it won't. It'll be pointing to the magnetic South Pole. Okay. Now it's not a huge difference, especially, well, the closer you get to the pole, the bigger the difference becomes. But from Newmarket, it's about 10 degrees off. So if you're using a compass to figure out where North is, you'll be off by 10 degrees. Right? But you can easily just correct that if you know the difference. All right. Um, just going to go through the important points. This is a nice 3D diagram of the magnetic field. It's important to know that a magnetic field is not two-dimensional, which you can sometimes get stuck in your head if you're using a compass, because right? a compass is just points along a two-dimensional plane. But we have these things called a dipping needle, which can tell you the angle of inclination. The angle of inclination is, well, the angle, the vertical angle that the magnetic field is actually pointing in. So you can visualize it more in three dimensions. All right, so we're going to talk about something called domain theory. Now, domain theory is um, a theory for how magnets actually form. Now I'm going to post a couple of videos, which is going to go deeper to the atomic level to see, okay, well, where do those domains come from in the first place? Which is really interesting. I suggest you watch it. 
But for the grade 12 course, they only expect you to start at domain theory, not atomic theory. But atomic theory is so much cooler, so go look at those videos. <laughs> All right, now we know that there are certain magnetic materials. They're called ferromagnetic materials. And obviously iron is one of them because, well, ferro is the name for iron. But nickel and cobalt are others. And so what makes these materials magnetic? Well, that you're going to have to go watch atomic theory. But let's say you had a chunk of iron, right? And this is our chunk. And inside of that chunk, you have different smaller chunks each with, with its own magnetic field. Now, if all those magnetic fields are pointing in complete opposite directions, once you add up all those magnetic fields together, the net field is going to be pretty close to zero. Okay, and just to let you know, here we have a circle with a dot and a circle with an X. I can't remember if I went over this in class, but the circle with the dot means the direction is going into the screen right now. Um, no, sorry, coming out of the screen. The circle with the dot is coming out of the screen, and the circle with the X is going into the screen. I like to try to remember it as an arrow. So if I shoot an arrow into the screen, I see um, the sort of X pattern made by the fletches or the feathers at the end, where if the arrow is coming out of the screen, you see the point of that arrow. All right, so this is out of screen and this is into screen. This is how we represent vectors in three dimensions. Now they're all going to add up to zero, but if I can somehow influence all these uh, magnetic field vectors to point in the same direction, then that chunk of iron, if it's iron, becomes magnetic. Very strongly so. All right, so there's... Some points I want to go over. One, objects can be induced to become magnetized. I, we just went over that explanation, right? If you have an object with all different domains inside of it pointing in different directions, all you need to do is influence them. To do that, you put them inside a magnetic field that's stronger than theirs, and they will all align themselves with the magnetic field that they're in. Number two, breaking a bar of magnets creates two magnets, right? So if I go back, Imagine cutting that right in half along this line here. Well, if I did that and I took away this half, well, I'm still left with a piece that is has both a south and a north end, right? That's what the arrow is. One side of the arrow is north, the other side of the arrow is south. There's no such things as magnetic monopoles. Um, String theory suggests there are magnetic monopoles, but they have never been observed experimentally. So there's no evidence for magnetic monopoles at all. Uh, number three, soft iron versus hard steels. Impurities of alloys tend to keep domains lined. Right? So if you have those impurities in there, it's harder for those domains to shift. Right? That kind of leads into... Um, Number six, I want to skip and talk about number six. Heating or dropping can demagnetize a magnet. So let's say, go back to here. Say you have this magnet and you start banging it. And if you start banging it, right, those domains are going to like wobble and shift and they can actually go out of place. As that happens, you're losing the strength of your magnetism. Now to make that um, more difficult to occur, you can add impurities, right? So hard steel with that impurities will be harder for those domains to shift. Number four, a strong magnetic field can reverse the poles of the magnet. This goes back into number one that I was talking about, how you can induce a magnet, but you can also take a magnet, which is all pointing in one direction, like this, put it in a magnetic field that's even stronger than that, pointing in the other direction, and they will shift their direction. And so you can change the direction of a magnetic field. Number five, magnetic induction from Earth's magnetic field and vibrations made in the metal. So Earth makes its own metals, right? Take a volcanic eruption. When you have that liquid, um, liquid rock or liquid metals, right? Some of them are magnetic metals. And when they are soft, their domains are free to move around like 
very easily. This is why heating a magnet can also demagnetize it as well. And you give it all that thermal energy and it makes them able to move around. So when you have this, this liquid metal, because it's moving around so much, it's very easily influenced by its surroundings. And its surroundings are the Earth's magnetic field. So while they're in the Earth's magnetic field, they will move to align themselves with the Earth's magnetic field. And then when they cool in that alignment, they get stuck there. And so now there are permanent magnets. So the Earth makes permanent magnets that way. And this is also how we've been able to tell that the Earth's magnetic field shifts every 10,000 years or so. So if you go down into the deep ocean where you have that, um, I can't remember what it's called right now. There's a, there's a rift that causes continental drift where new rock just keeps coming up. Right. And then in the water, it's hot and then it cools and then new rock comes up and pushes those outwards and cools. A new rock pushes them outwards and cools. So you get these parallel layers of rocks. And when we analyze those layers, the magnetic field switches from one layer to the next. And it's about every 10,000 years that it's switching. Now, because it's every 10,000 years, we haven't directly observed a switch, but scientists predict the next one will happen within the next thousand years. So we probably won't see that happen, but when it does happen, it's going to be quite a view. <laughs> All right. So currently our magnetic field strength is weakening and we're assuming that's happening because we're getting ready for a switch and it's not going to do this. It's not going to go switch. It'll do something weird. It'll weaken, weaken, and then go something and it'll go all sorts of like weird magnetic fields like the sun until it switches. So when that happens, you're going to see the Aurora. You can probably go to Hawaii and see the Aurora, but a thousand years. So we can't, sorry. All right, moving on types of magnetic materials. Now there's three types. We talked about ferromagnetic. Those are permanent magnets. There's also paramagnetic and diamagnetic. Both paramagnetic and diamagnetic are temporary magnets. So for example, take your fridge. Is your fridge a magnet? Well, you stick magnets to it. So does that mean it's a magnet? I mean, you can't stick a magnet to a drywall, right? Just up against your wall. You can't stick a magnet to there. So the wall's not magnet. Wood's not magnet. But you can stick a magnet to the fridge. Does that mean your fridge is a magnetic? If it is, and if you took a paper clip, now paper clips stick to magnets as well. If you took a paper clip and put it up against your fridge, would it stick? You might not have to do this experiment. You might already know it's not going to stick. And this is because both your fridge and the paper clip are paramagnetic materials, meaning they're temporary. And what that means is when they're placed inside of a magnetic field, they will align their magnetic field to be attracted to that magnetic field. And then once that magnetic field is removed, their domains just shift all over the place and they're no longer magnetic. This is why you can stick magnets to fridge, but not paper clips. A magnet is a permanent magnet. So when you put it on the fridge, that portion of the fridge you place it on, its magnetic field aligns to be attracted. Now diamagnetic is the opposite type of temporary. Diamagnetic materials are materials that will temporarily align their magnetic fields to be repelled from the magnetic field they're placed in. Now this is not, uh, whenever I say this, a lot of people say, um, oh, superconductivity, or some people say, oh, maglev trains. No. Okay, maglev trains do use mag magnetic properties to get trains to levitate, but they do not use paramagnetic properties or diamagnetic properties. Okay, they use electromagnets, and I will put a video on um, maglev trains if you're interested in how those work. Superconductivity is a lot more complicated. Um, you have like a quantum effect. That, um, and if you like, I can put a video of that on if you're interested in superconductivity. 
Um, I love superconductivity. I did my thesis on superconductivity. But unfortunately, it's not part of the grade 12 curriculum. But I'll put a video that sort of introduces it. Okay, if you're interested in diamagnetic material, a good one is pyrolytic carbon. So I put a picture there of an example of pyrolytic carbon. It's just a piece of pyrolytic carbon. And it's sitting on top of some permanent magnets. You can see it's actually levitating a couple milliliters, millimeters above the material. Now superconductors are great diamagnets. They're perfect, like 100% perfect. But I'll show you a video on that. All right, that's it for permanent magnets. Now let's talk about electromagnetism. We're going to step back a few hundred years where Orsted made a discovery. He couldn't explain this discovery, but when he took a compass and put it next to a wire such that the compass was aligned so that it was pointing parallel to the direction of the wire, and then he sent a current through the wire, and suddenly the compass changed orientation, and now it was pointing in a direction perpendicular to the wire. Couldn't explain this. Didn't make sense, right? This is electricity, not magnetism. Why is electricity causing magnetic forces? At this time, people thought that electricity and magnetism were separate subjects. There's completely separate um, properties in nature they had nothing to do with each other and so this was very confusing and people were copying Orsted's experiments all over the world seeing how this worked not how it worked but seeing that it is doing something but nobody really knowing how it works and that gets to the story of Michael Faraday um, Michael Faraday at the time was um, more like a, a secretary to um, a chemist, what was the chemist's name? I can't remember. Look up the chemist who discovered sodium. It was him. And they sort of made fun of Faraday a bit. And just said, why don't you try and do something with it? And that's when things took off. That's when he actually explained it. That's when he started creating the first motor, the first transformer, the first generator. And he became probably the most important scientist of the day. And I don't know, he's my favorite physicist. He also, he started, you could look up his story. There's a Cosmos video about him. I can't post that video because it's not a YouTube video. And I don't have the rights to post it. But definitely in season one, there's a Cosmos video called The Electric Boy. If you have the opportunity to watch it, watch it. Okay. Um, it's all about Michael Faraday's life. He started off as a very, very poor boy, never got any schooling. And he ended up working in a bookshop. And he would bind books during the day and read them at night. And so he was very interested in all sorts of sciences. And he ended up climbing up to be the head of the Royal Society in such a class-driven society and the most important scientist of the time. And one of the cool things he did is he started um, free lectures on Christmas for kids where any kid can come and watch and he'd do all these demonstrations and get them interested in science. And that still continues to this day. So in England at the Royal Society every year there's um, a scientist that comes and does the annual Christmas lecture. Which is pretty cool. Anyways, I won't go through his entire life story. If you can watch that Cosmos video, I recommend it. All right. Also, uh, we need to talk about the direction in which current travels. In grade nine, you studied current. Right? And what did we say? We draw a little circuit. Now we're not going to go over circuits. Right? Um, but let's draw a circuit. We did this in grade 11 too. Here, I'll put in a nice resistor there. There's our negative side, there's our positive side. I say, well, okay, well, which direction of the current travel? Well, well, it's the electrons that actually move, so the current travels in this direction. Well, if you've looked at your grade 12 textbook already, it says current travels in this direction. Is it wrong? Well, technically, no. Remember, it's just a convention, right? Why is an electron a negative charge? Who determined it was a negative charge? 
Well, someone just decided it was a negative charge. Right? Nature didn't decide it was negative. Nature decided that an electron and a proton have opposite charges. And they decide, nature decided that those properties would cause them to attract. Okay, well, we study those properties. And then we see, okay, these ones attract, these ones repel. There seems to be two types of charges. And if they're the same, they repel. If they're opposite, they attract. Okay. Well, just like when we do forces, we say, okay, well, let's make up positive. Well, someone decided, okay, well, let's make that negative and that positive. And at the time, um, forgetting the person's name, the guy who held the key in the thunderstorm. I'm having lots of mind blanks today. Franklin, Benjamin Franklin. So Benjamin Franklin said at the time, we came up, okay, let's name this one positive, this one negative. They didn't know about the atom yet, but they were still understanding there are diff like two different charges. And they assumed, or they just decided by convention, that's the positive charges that move. And that's still a convention used everywhere, right? in pretty much any university textbook, including your high school textbook. And so this is called conventional current. where this is called electron flow. Okay, so we are going to be talking about throughout the rest of this course, conventional current. So whenever I say the current's moving in this direction, I'm talking about conventional current. Whenever we go over certain rules, like right-hand rules, I'll be talking about conventional current, okay? All right, so let's continue. Now, let's go back to this problem. Now, Orsted had this problem where we had a current through a wire seems to move a compass. And it was Faraday that determined it's because a current produces a magnetic field around the wire in a circular pattern. Now, if we're going to figure out the direction of the magnetic field, we're going to use something called the right-hand rule. There's many right-hand rules, okay? Uh, you probably did them in calculus because right-hand rules comes from the cross product of two vectors. Now with this one, this one we're going to take up our right hand. This is my right hand. I don't know if the video is inverted or not, but this is my right hand. Right? I'm going to put my thumb in the direction of the current. Right? I think this is the opposite from what the actual PowerPoint um, image looks like, but take your thumb, put it in the direction of the current, which is to the left in this picture. And then your fingers will rotate around, pointing in the direction of the magnetic field. So at the top, it's pointing into the screen, and at the bottom, it's coming out of the screen. Okay? And this is a little example I did with iron filings. Um, and I took a picture of it. Luckily, I still have that picture, even though the equipment's all in the classroom. But that's a wire going through a piece of glass. It's a very thick wire, so I got a lot of current going through there. And then I just sprinkled iron filings on the glass, and I sent a current through it. And you can see the, the shape that those iron filings are making. It's like a circular pattern of, around the wire. You could also probably tell that the closer it is to the wire, the stronger the field, because the lines are much closer together the closer you get. Okay. Um, now, if we made a loop, you can, you know, do your right hand rule around the loop, and you'll see that the direction of the field going through the middle of the loop is always the same. And if we keep looping, the more loops we do, the more fields are going to go through that line. So the more loops you have, you're going to get a stronger and stronger and stronger magnetic field through the center. Now we call this coil a solenoid, and it's very, very important for producing electricity. And I did the same example here. Now something else you'd probably notice here is, yeah, the iron filings are sort of lining up, making lines inside the solenoid, but outside the solenoid, pretty much nothing. 
And it's because the magnetic field outside the sol solenoid is almost essentially zero. Okay, it's another important point that we can use. All right, next, relative magnetic permeability. Wow, okay. So <laughs> what this pretty much means is if you have a solenoid and you put a current through it, you will get a magnetic field through the center. Now, if you want to make it even stronger, you can put a magnetic material, such as iron, through the center. The magnetic fields will cause iron to align its magnetic fields in the same direction and increase the strength of that magnetic field. And how much that strength gets increased, we call the relative magnetic permeability. Now, for something like iron, we have a value of 6,100 times. So the magnetic field increases in strength by a factor of 6,100 times. Now, if you put copper, which is not a magnetic material at all, you can see it's 0.9999, so it almost slightly reduces it. So you definitely want iron in your solenoid. Last thing I want to mention is something called magnetic field strength. Now, I've been talking about it throughout this entire PowerPoint, but it is um, a variable that we will be calculating. We give it the symbol B. Magnetic field strength is capital B. It is a vector. Right? It's a vector quantity. I don't have the vector symbol there, but I made it bold. Right? And we measure it in a quantity called Teslas. Now, I will define what Teslas are in its SI units in another lesson. But for now, let's just look at how much is an actual Tesla? Well, your brain that has neurons going through it, so that's electric charges that move. Anytime you have electric charges that move, we've learned that, well, it produces a magnetic field. And in this case, it's on the order of about one picotesla. I just like saying that. Uh, Earth's magnetic field at about a 50 degree latitude, that's close to where we are, is about 58 microteslas. Uh, your refrigerator magnets are about 5 milliteslas. If you have a very strong neodymium rare earth magnet, I have one. It's like um, a rectangular prism on my whiteboard. You might have seen it before. It's 1.25 teslas. And be careful. If you put that up against your credit card, it will erase it. But just so you know, I've done this experiment. It does not erase your debt. <laughs> It just erases your credit card, so you can't use it anymore. The information is no longer stored there. Too bad. They fixed that problem with their chips now, though, but... Oh, well. It was worth a shot. <laughs> um, an MRI machine. We will be going over how an MRI machine actually works in our quantum mechanics unit, but it does produce a magnetic field on the order of 1 to 3 Teslas. And I have a couple other ones. You might have heard a physicist doing an experiment to levitate a frog. That required 16 Teslas. The largest we've ever produced is 730 Teslas, and it destroyed the entire laboratory. And neutron stars are on the order of up to 1 to 100 mega Tesla, which is um, 10 to the 6 Teslas. Okay. So that's the end of that video. There's no problems. We'll start the problems in lesson two, but I'm going to post this video along with other suggested YouTube videos that um, I recommend you watch as well. All right. Until next time.